hello. Thank you for joining us today for yet another episode of Indian Forum for Public Diplomacy's podcast. Today, our theme is locating India in South Asian geopolitics, and we are joined with none other than Dr. Sri Radha Datta, ma'am. Dr. Datta is a non-resident senior fellow at Institute for South Asian Studies at NUS Singapore and professor at OP Jindal Global University. Ma'am currently serves as a senior fellow at the Vivekananda International Foundation, bringing a wealth of experience and knowledge to our discussion. Previously, she has held the position of director at the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies in Kolkata, and her research focus is centered around regional organizations with a keen interest in issues related to borders, migrations, and water dynamics across the South Asian and Southeast Asian neighborhoods. A prolific author, Dr. Datta has contributed significantly to the academic landscape with six books and monographs. Some of her notable works include Caretaking Democracy, Political Process in Bangladesh, The Northeast Complexities and Its Determinants, and she has also co-edited volumes on changing security dynamics in Southeast Asia and political economy of India's Northeast borders. Dr. Datta's insightful monographs, The Changing Narrative, India's Borders with Bangladesh and Myanmar, and Drug Menace in South Asia, Pakistan Connections, underscore her commitment to understanding complex geopolitical challenges, and her extensive publication record includes over 100 articles in journals edited volumes, newspapers, and academic websites. In addition to her academic contribution, Dr. Datta has participated in Track to Dialogues in South Asia for over two decades. It is an honor to have Professor Dr. Shirata Datta with us today, and we eagerly anticipate her valuable insights as we delve into our discussion on regional dynamics and geopolitical challenges in South and Southeast Asia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Shirata Datta. Ma'am, the very first question that we have for today is, could you elucidate the nuances uh, of the ties that exist in the Indian Myanmar China tri junction in a much broader sense of the term, especially in light of Myanmar's emerging military authoritarianism and declining sovereignty. Thank you, Sashta. I'm happy to be here. Please excuse my bad voice, but I'm going to try and um, speak slowly so that I'm a little more audible. Mm -hmm. And um, I think your readers shouldn't have an issue with it, uh, your listeners rather, viewers. Mm -hmm. um, yes, to begin with, I think, as, as you mentioned, uh, Myanmar has very close ties historically with both China as well as India. Mm -hmm. There's ethnic overlap, there's geography on both sides, which, you know, are contiguous borders with China, they're contiguous borders with us. Mm -hmm. So there, over the years, we've seen that... Uh, the relation has, of course, changed over the years. But very, I mean, you know, capsule, one can say that the Chinese and the Myanmar relation is very complex. I mean, at, at a simple level to say that their military, uh, you know, the, the, mil the en en entire military strength that Myanmar has, has been supported by China largely. Whole lot of economic support too, in terms of many large projects which have been, some have already have taken place. There's lots of economic corridors that they're doing, the CPEC and, you know, such other large projects which are already underway. Uh, so th that engagement is on. Politically, of course, they're very active. But again, either with the junta, which is their army, or with the civilians, the relationship is not straightforward. I mean, there are a lot of complexities to it because even the Chinese, uh, uh, while want to engage, it's not that it's always been a kind of a upward trend. There has been dips, there has been lows. And uh, we've seen a huge amount of investment coming in, as I mentioned, in both infrastructure as non-infrastructure projects. But again, I think there is a bit of basic mistrust towards China both within the civilian population that of course they're very open about it they will discuss this quite openly that they don't trust but even within the armed forces uh, it isn't as if it's all you know a simple uh, kind of monolithic relationship it's not like vis-a-vis -vis India we also have a large number of engagements that's ongoing in terms of projects whether the civil society education uh, health uh, again infrastructure non-infrastructure projects a whole lot of border economic, uh, you know, development that's taking place. Mm -hmm. Several other engagements are also in the agro sector. So again, India has a very broad based uh, mm -hmm. relationship with Myanmar. But I think the advantage that India has is that nobody looks at India through that critical eye. I mean, they're not suspicious of India's motives or intentions at all. I think that's across the board. 
and while uh, we worked very closely for obvious reasons with the you know the military in place as well as a government in place and which largely over the last few decades has been the uh, the military uh, establishment uh, at the same time because of the ethnic overlap and the kind of cross border you know the uh, openness that we have has also endeared india to the civilians there so i think india really in that sense while obviously we of course have many projects going on while one could easily say that china has far larger big projects big ticket projects maybe india doesn't have that and some of our projects especially the you know the citra project and some of the projects have also been uh, kind of behind schedule for a variety of reasons and uh, but at the same time lot of work is still going on right now of course it's a very precarious situation so obviously things are all for the moment but overall i think all across myanmar there is a kind of a warmth and you know a support for and they of course the civilian level they have often told us that we want larger engagement from india we want india to do more with us so that's something that's you know that's the basic difference but at the same time i would say that despite as i said the reservations that um, myanmar people or even the you know the military forces have towards china it's a uh, accepted fact that china has very well entrenched itself in the system there thank you ma'am uh, how do you think the india myanmar thailand trilateral highway has impacted uh, has been impacted by the military regime in myanmar and uh, how does it pose challenges to india's active policies uh, you know uh, with regards to its developmental projects uh, so far as myanmar is concerned their largest two stakeholders are thai thailand and china so, so there has been a close work, working like that that working relationship is very good their border trade is fabulous their trade bilateral trade is fabulous so you know that's been something which is been flourishing uh, it always has some points of tension um, in terms of uh, uh, uh drug issues in terms of the criminal activity which is going on in the border just now so there there are issues again as i said it's never a flat high or a flat low kind of thing it's a very complex layered relationship but at the same time india has also as i said mentioned work with in terms of the lookies and the actis i would actually say if you look at the trade figures and the economic engagement the projects that we are doing india is obviously deepening its engagement and you know while some of the projects hasn't been completed on schedule for as i mentioned for some other re- variety of reasons but at the same time uh, and one would think that we have your uh, you know having the trilateral highway which was give us greater a uh, straight access to thailand once situation changes on the ground it'll be a different dynamics and i think again southeast asia or thailand for that matter has a very robust engagement with india so our lookies policy as well as actis policy indian engagement in southeast asia has been very very robust it's grown mm-hmm. now the actis is all about the northeast so we'll come to that later but in terms of india's engagement with southeast asia uh, through its you know policies towards that region it's only grown over years it's become stronger and i think we're going to see stronger ties happening in the years to come right ma'am uh, how much uh, has the current myanmar conflict in your view influenced the possibility of supply chain and trade route delays for the trilateral highway project and is it possible that the project's development phases might encounter more delays uh, this whole thing ever since the coup happened and uh, we've seen the last few months where uh, you know the uh, the sri badhur alliance or the economic uh, the the ethnic uh, revolution organizations as well as the nug all of them you know at some level uh, there is dynamics going on and right now as just now while we speak we are aware of the fact that it seems a large part of the territory has moved away from the you know is not within the control of the military anymore mm-hmm. so obviously the local dynamics are you know important and at that point of time mm-hmm. uh, clearly as i said none of our the trilateral highway or the citway project are kind of stalled for the moment uh, but as I, again uh, all these projects are going to i'm sure find you know completion once the stability the stability on the ground and at this point of time clearly uh, you know the value chains that you're talking about has uh, kind of become disjointed there hasn't been a follow up or you know the local conditions are such that both uh, political stability is the i think the core uh, 
factor for any such improvement in economic ties. But as I, as I said, I'm hopeful things will uh, change, the local dynamics will change. It seems that this particular, the non uh, the non-military uh, group, various groups who are supporting each other are going to emerge victorious and we really hope that uh, Myanmar sees uh, democracy return and uh, we hope that it's a people's government that's going to you know, be established and we hope that there'll be political stability and India's engagement will continue to uh, grow over the years. Absolutely, ma'am. Um, and with the subsequent increase of Chinese developmental partnership with Myanmar, how do you think the Act East policy can help India in reducing Chinese influence in the Southeast Asia? That's a tricky one. No matter how much India does, and India is doing very a lot. And there is, as I said, mentioned um, with the Southeast Asian economies, whole lot of new uh, development partnerships have going on and, you know, deep engagement at various levels. Uh, economic commerce, political. So, but at the same time, uh, I don't know really, I would say that that's going to make a dent in the relation that China has with them. There are several countries within the Southeast Asian economies who are also very wary about China and its intention. Uh, they don't see eye to eye on several, you know, reasons. It's all very well known. But uh, at the same time, it's impossible to say that in a, India is going to take care of everything and, you know, China won't be a factor there. That, I don't think that's the situation which I'm likely to see in the near future. China will always have interest in that region. It's it's really, a, it's you know, it's not going to let go of that way uh, easily. Uh, economies are very well entrenched with each other. Again, there's a whole lot of engagement that's impossible for these economies to kind of drive out. But at the same time, uh, I think they're keeping their options open. They're engaging with other powers also. For instance, Japan is... Uh, becoming an important player both in Myanmar and other you know Southeast Asian economy so it's it's going to be a multi-layer you know stakeholders uh, kind of working together but of course we are you know we do understand that uh, while some work much more closely with China there are some economies within Southeast Asia who are very wary so that's going to be there but completely to say that India is going to be so deeply engaged that there'll be no scope for Chinese engagement I don't think that's ever going to be a situation like that. Um, how do you think ma'am the shift from look east policy to look act policy will build a stronger foundation for ASEAN and Indo-Pacific economic framework? You know the act east policy uh, was all about involving the northeast uh, with uh, the you know with the southeast asian economies and uh, so towards that there's a whole gamut of projects and infrastructure projects as well as other development uh, uh, ideas which are put in place uh, there uh, been a huge amount of cross border connectivity being developed there are new airports that have been built uh, and you know infrastructure as i mentioned including transport corridors uh, but at the same time if i really examine the Actis policy of 2014. I've in fact written a book on this. Uh, I would actually say that Northeast is going to partner, you know, with the Southeast Asian economies to some extent. And Northeast actually is a huge and incredibly important bridge between South Asia and Southeast Asia. But given the geography of Northeast, uh, given its economies, given the kind of, you know, issues that remain there, uh, it's impossible for it to be a large stakeholder in that sense. Uh, at certainly, transport corridors are built. Uh, Northeast is going to be kind of a transit route. But how much can Northeast, through its own economy base, contribute in terms of the bilateral relationship that we have with Southeast? I actually hold on to that a little bit. And uh, because for the simple reason I've seen Northeast has a very different uh, uh, socio-economic geographical platform. It's not something that, you know, what the mainland India in terms of what Andhra Pradesh can, what uh, Karnataka can, what Maharashtra can, that the capacity and the wherewithal that they have towards building commercial and economic ties is very different. So while Northeast as a geography is connecting Southeast Asia and India and South Asia with Southeast Asia. Its uh, ability to be part of that whole thing has, has its limitations. But again, the geography is an important geography. And again, for the first time, we've seen a huge amount of development taking place for the Northeast and which has made life for the Northeasterns better. 
because for the first time, Northeast within themselves are able to move from one to the other. Railway lines are being built, infrastructure, other projects are in place. But as an economic partner, I would, uh, I have my skepticism and I'm quite open. And, and that book is all about, uh, I, I've detailed that out, which of course, I, there's no scope in this particular talk, but anybody interested can look up my book, which is called Acting's Policy in India's Northeast. Absolutely, ma'am. Uh, I would request, uh, I would urge our viewers to definitely go through ma'am's book. Uh, the next question that we have for you today, ma'am, is uh, do you believe that India's bilateral relations with Bangladesh, uh, with China and Bhutan uh, be impacted with, by the ongoing crisis in Myanmar? And how is China contributing significantly to the current crisis by altering the geopolitics of South and Southeast Asia? One, of course, if you, um, you know, when you're talking about um, Bangladesh per se, the fact of the, you know, the fact that Bangladesh holds the largest number of Rohingya refugees in its soil uh, and that, you know, nor India nor anybody else, the world, you know, the international um, community could actually make Myanmar change its mind and in fact they'd gone back on their promise they had said they were going to uh, you know go for repatriation that never happened uh, political instability in Myanmar has of course been an issue but again we know the military in the first phase wouldn't have uh, you know kind of enabled a situation where the Rohingyas are forced to uh, flee uh, the lands uh, so obviously uh, that hasn't happened that they're very disappointed pointed about India's lack of movement on this particular aspect, while Indian projects in Northeast and uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, Bangladesh has also expressed concern that they want to be part of the project. And uh, so there is also a larger vision within Bangladesh. They also have something which is called a Lukis policy, mm -hmm. where they want to also engage with uh, the Southeast Asian economies more strongly, more deeply, and they realize that a good way to is to you know, uh, tie up with India, join the economic corridors, the transport corridors. Uh, but again, all of this will happen only once the uh, there's political stability. Vis -vis Bhutan, of course, um, India-Bhutan relations are very stable. And uh, irrespective of what happens in the, you know, neighborhood, I, I'm not sure that's going to actually going to alter anything. Of course, it's a, you know, it's a changing dynamic everywhere. And it's never going to be static. But I think we are still on a very, very positive footing with them. And overall, I would say, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed your last part of the question. What was that? Um, the last part of the question was, uh, how is China contributing to the current crisis by altering the geopolitics of the South and Southeast Asia? We, yes, it's a very interesting mix that we see just now, as I mentioned, that you know, the layers that China has there is very significant. So at one level, they've been accusing Myanmar, or rather Myanmar has been accusing China of, you know, um, uh, some of the difficult situation they're finding on the border, the criminal activities, which they, they blame China for. China, of course, has uh, publicly said they had nothing to do with it. Uh, there's lots of arms. Uh, there's, uh, apart from the arms issue, there's also a drug uh, issue, which again, they feel that, you know, China has a role. So each one accuses the other so there are kind of led but right now when they see so i think right now the jury is really out because china as we know while they've always worked well with whoever government is there they realize when the political situation is changing they're likely to also change their uh, moves and they're not going to you know and again uh, whichever and uh, it's it's a long way off now that uh, uh, people will capture power will have they will have there'll be return of democracy also need Chinese support and however much they are not in favor of China but you know in terms of the uh, deep pockets in the region China of course is one of the larger so China right now is playing uh, very very smoothly it's also kind of you know there, there's a kind of a group within who believes that China's um, turning a blind eye to some of the things that are happening within there, but they will absolutely keep their options open. And the minute they see the dynamics have changed, they will be also be able to, uh, it, you know, quite overtly engage with them and offer them things that uh, only they can. And which I think a nation that's gone through such instability will always need uh, to kind of calm itself down and kind of stabilize both its politics as well as economics.
Right, ma'am. Thank you for answering our questions. That were all the questions that we have for the day. I would request our viewers, if you'd like to um, know more on these topics, to go through uh, all the written work that ma'am has done. She has published so, published so many books on the themes ranging from democracy to uh, security dynamics, changing security dynamics in uh, Southeast Asia to Northeast complexities. And as mentioned by her uh, in the previous answer, her book on uh, Actis Policy and Northeast India is a must read if you are interested in this topic. Thank you for joining us today, ma'am. I'm Shreshtha from Team IFPD, uh, taking uh, your leave today. And uh, uh, I request our viewers to keep connected for our upcoming episodes.